Hi! Well, this week we're considering African American religions, and as is our custom, I'll just touch on a few key themes and issues that you'll likely encounter in the readings and provide you a little bit additional context. Well, last time when we talked about African religions, we talked about the challenges engaging in African religions, that the word religion itself is not in, seen in many African cultures. And so the applicability of that particular term when we're thinking about African religions. We also talked about just how vast Africa is, that it's a continent and not a country. So lots of variety, lots of different um, diversity in religious and spiritual expressions on the continent. And so it's really challenging to say anything to point to any characteristics that every African religious tradition holds in common. But given that, that, given that caveat, we say, well, are there some things that we can point towards that many, if not all, African religious traditions actually hold in common? And so one is that it's an oral tradition. Often many African religious communities pass their stories down, pass their rituals down through an oral tradition, which we talked about previously. There's often a central figure, often a supreme deity, a central figure, oftentimes a creator god in many African religious traditions. And then beyond the sort of central figure, there's often lesser divinities and these spirits and spiritual beings that have particular realms of influence, sky god pantheons or pantheons devoted to the water, for example. We talked about the importance of ancestors and having that connection to those that have passed away. And so rituals and stories to connect to the ancestors that although they passed away, showing respect to the ancestors has an impact on the present state of the community. We talked about medicine people and other religious leaders, as well as the challenges of using words like shaman and um, and um, witch doctor and how problematic those terms are. And so looking at the different roles that different religious leaders and African communities hold, being able to do divination, being able to see the future, or using herbs to heal people, for example, or looking at um, or, hold, or uh, overseeing particular religious rituals. We talked about spirit possession happening in certain rituals as the drums and music and the movement occurs that sometimes a spirit will descend on someone in the community and then they can predict the future or, or through the dance communicate what the particular divinities want for the community at any particular point in time. We talked about witches and sorcerers, again, those that are out to harm and challenge people. And again, some debate about whether witches and sorcerers are a part of the African religious system or more on the outside of those traditions. And then again, we problematize the term magic, that oftentimes people talk about the ap magical powers in African religious communities and whether that's an appropriate term to use. But we did note that there are charms, so there's defensive magic to protect people from particular spiritual forces. And there's also offensive magic where people can seek to harm someone if they get something, an object that's been close to the person or a hair follicle or, um, or maybe a nail clipping. Anything that's been close to the person could be used for their harm. And so for our purposes, one question is that, well, we talked about the complexity of African religious traditions. And so how much of those expressions do we see in African American religions? Well, this is a very long debate. And so what I thought I'd do is just point you towards two figures that are seen as sort of the extremities of the two positions. There's clearly nuance in between the two, but just to get a sense of sort of what's at stake in the way that at least some scholars have framed the issue. The first person is E. Franklin Frazier. He wrote a book called The Negro Church in America in 1963. And in that book, he laid out all the reasons why he felt like it would be really particularly difficult for African Americans to have retained any of their African religious worldview. One thing he pointed towards was the process of enslavement, very violent, ripping people from their homeland, packing them into these ships and transporting them to America through the Middle Passage, through these months long journey. And the trauma of that passage, Frazier argued, would make it really difficult for African Americans to retain any kind of African religious worldview. He also pointed to the passage of earlier generations so that as those who had actually been to Africa passed away, there's a whole new generation born in America who had never been to Africa. And so how does that impact the dynamics? How much of an African culture could you know if you've never actually been there? He also talked about the dynamics on the various plantations that the laws put in place to prevent people from retaining their culture, so preventing people from retaining their language, making sure they didn't learn to read, separating people if they seem to have any sorts of connections. 
And so it's in this. And so from Fraser's perspective, African culture is destroyed through the violence of the slave trade and life and slavery. And that vacuum then that's created by that violence is filled up by Christianity. So that, um, again, Fraser makes the case that young males, maybe not the best bearers of culture. Maybe they're not able to, since they're the ones who came primarily in the slave trade from his perspective, that they'd be poor bearers of culture and remembering their African history. He talks about there being this mixture pulling Africans from different regions of Africa. And again, we talked about the diversity of the different communities. How difficult would it be for those to communicate and to form any kind of bond to remember and share their African culture if people are pulled from various regions of Africa? And again, as I already mentioned, the trauma of the Middle Passage, so violent, such a terrible, very little to eat, packed tightly in these ships, that is so, such a horrific experience, Frazier argued, that it'd be really difficult for African Americans to have retained much of their African culture. Frazier also pointed towards that these smaller plantations relative to places like South America, where Africans had were more, much more closely supervised. So again, very difficult to retain your culture when the slaveholders are, are potentially trying to strip you of your culture and have you become more acculturated to an Africa to American environment. The seasoning process, Fraser pointed towards prohibitions against African speaking African languages. They're under constant surveillance. Uh, small farms. So again, lots of close watching. Very difficult for African Americans to have any sort of private secret rituals or connections to Africa. In particular, Fraser pointed toward laws that prevented gatherings of five or more, uh, African Americans at any one time. Uh, so really difficult, unstable family life. Again, someone could be sold at any moment. A mother can be sold away from their children, a father um, from their family. So in some cases, children separated. And so again, it creates a very tricky and terrible dynamic. And so how much of African culture really could be can, could be retained, Frazier argued. And so this is a quote from Frazier's book, The Negro Church in America, just to sort of, sort of drive home the point that Frazier said it is impossible to establish any continuity between African religious practices and the Negro church in the United States. So for Frazier, it's given all those dynamics that he laid out, all those really difficult challenges and obstacles, really difficult for African Americans to have retained any of their African culture. Melva J. Herskovitz had a very different take on that. So Melva J. Herskovitz wrote a book on, called The Myth of the Negro Past, in 1941, and in this book he addressed what he saw as five myths that uh, surrounded the question about African American history. And so, one, again, these are all super troubling and problematic, and this is what Hiskovitz was trying to, to challenge. So one, this prevalence that African Americans were naturally childlike in character. And so again, Herskovich challenged that, the sort of the racist dynamic with that statement, that clearly African Americans are just as intellectual as any other group of people. There was also a predominant um, suggestion that only the poorest stock were enslaved in Africa, so that the kings or those that were really smart could avoid the nets. And Herskovich again makes the case that the slave trade wasn't selective, they didn't just pick the poorer people or the less intelligent people. It, people were drawn for all walks of life and all different social and economic statuses in Africa during the slave trade. He also challenged that, this idea that that African Americans had lost or Africans had lost tribal identity, that there is no least common denominator nation denominator or or point of understanding between Africans. So for Kerskovin made the case that actually the opposite was true. That in a traumatic situation, people cling more tightly to their religious beliefs and practices. They don't necessarily abandon them. So the Africans were able to make a connection despite the, the external obstacles that they faced. There's also this predominant notion that African culture was so savage and relatively low in scale that they just accepted European superiority. And again, Herskovich challenged all that really problematic dynamic um, that really sort of came out of this racist dynamic of seeing Africa is this quote-unquote dark continent. And so he challenged this idea that somehow Africans just sort of gave up their culture because European culture was so much more superior. And finally, the big one that he also challenged was the idea that Africans, Americans don't have a past. And again, we see how problematic even that suggestion is and and even troubling that Herskovich even have to, to, to make this argument, but that yes, African Americans do have a past and it's important and just as rich as any other uh, community.
And so Herskovitz, you know, in contrast to uh, E. Franklin Fraser, sees African retentions and, and connections back to African culture in different aspects of African religious traditions, African American religious traditions. One are shouting churches, where there's sort of the movement and ritual of, of African churches. Herskovitz sees that as a, as a a common denominator he sees with, with churches and communities in Africa where they're shouting and uh, feedback so that the the leader of the community says something, this sort of call and response dynamic where the leader says something, the community says it back to them. He sees that in um, African American religious communities as well. Spirit possession by the Holy Ghost um, that he sees in many African American churches in America, again, it points back to African religious traditions where spirits would descend and the, the, this category of spirit possession was also present in African religious traditions as well. He also sees it in motor behavior that as African Americans in some communities begin to move and respond to the Holy Spirit, he sees sort of similar motor behavior, sort of movement and hand gestures and dance that he sees in uh, African American communities. He sees those also in the African religious communities that he studied. Rhythmic hand clapping, he sees that present in African American religious traditions, as well as those in Africa. This immediacy of God, this idea that God is present right there as you're in your worship service. Again, Herskovitz sees that as being a, a retention from many African religious traditions. And then even baptism by immersion, um, that this link back to African views of water in Africa, that this sort of connections to particular that particular religious communities had this deep connection to water. He sees that as one explanation for why um, African Americans may be drawn to baptism or the Baptist tradition. So again, each there's pros and cons to each of their approaches, and clearly you can make an argument that they each, in in their efforts to make their argument, maybe go a little bit too far. So, for example, the the immediacy of God. I mean, lots of religious traditions have that idea that God is close to them. Or even baptism by immersion, some scholars see that as a little bit of a stretch that to connect water cults in Africa to why African Americans are choosing, choosing the black Baptist tradition, some would say, ah, oh, it's a little maybe, is that too much of a stretch to make that argument? Or is there other evidence that you need to put forward to be able to persuasively make that case? Similarly for E. Franklin Frazier, to make a case that nothing survived from Africa, again, some would say that's a little bit too dramatic, a little too far to go. And so it seems like there's also that, that more nuanced position that both Herskovitz and Frazier are making good cases, and it almost is like a case-by-case -case situation to sort of see what evidence one finds persuasive to say that, yes, it likely came from this ritual or this myth or this story or this belief came from Africa, likely need more evidence and kind of a case-by-case -case to see which of those examples we would find most persuasive. So we do have this question ongoing, how African are African-American religions? And so there's lots of challenges with that dynamic. And again, different scholars have different criteria for what they find persuasive. For one is that the Middle Passage. What is the impact of the Middle Passage? As I sort of pointed towards earlier, is the Middle Passage something, it's a traumatic event, it's horrific, but is it the kind of event that actually brings people closer, that would actually have people draw more closely to their religious traditions and practices? and rituals, or is the middle passage tra traumatic in the sense that it rips people away from it, that people begin to f forget their heritage. And again, there's what you see, uh, the tabula rasa, you'll see it in, in our readings as well, this idea that Africans arrive as a blank slate, so nothing, no memories of their African homeland, and that's more in the Fraser camp. But for others, or does it begin in America? That and so when we're talking about African American religious history, does it start in Africa or does it start in America? Which again is more of Fraser's argument that when we talk about that, he would, Fraser would also say that African American religious traditions are distinctive, but he would say it's distinctive because that's a religious tradition that emerges from the oppressive state of slavery. So that slavery and that that dynamic is what gives African American religious traditions its um, its distinctiveness. Well, Herskovitz wants to take the story back further and say, no, what makes African American religions distinctive is that it begins in Africa and that they held onto their beliefs through the Middle Passage to the present. And again, as you do the reading, see which one you find more persuasive. And again, and there's the, the dynamics may be that the in between kind of more nuanced arguments may be the ones that might be more persuasive. So see which ones seem to uh, connect with you and what evidence do you find persuasive in thinking about African-American religious traditions connecting back to Africa?
So again, evidence, different scholars draw on different kinds of evidence to look at the African dynamics of African American religious traditions. Some want to look at exact slave trade routes, so they want to know where you departed from in West Africa, what location did you arrive in North America, and then compare specific religious communities within those two regions. And so that kind of specificity for some scholars is what is necessary. Uh, for others, and, and in that context, this idea of exact replication to be an African retention that you see in African American religious traditions doesn't have to look exactly the same. So you see a ritual in Africa performed, you come to New Orleans, see the same ritual performed, it's exactly the same, okay, that's an African retention that we can see in African American culture. But again, so challenging to do that because it's not as if cultures are static. Cultures are always evolving and moving. So African cultures are changing. The cultures in America are changing. And so it's a really challenging dynamic to sort of locate in one particular moment in time this exact ritual and being formed in the exact same way in America. Other scholars want to look at it more as a creative process, that it's less about an exact sort of point of departure, point of arrival, comparison and more of a situation where it's the creative process. Are there the ways that African religious and spiritual expression um, express themselves that we see similar kinds of expressions in America? Others like Charles Long want to make a case that there's sort of this unconscious dynamic so that even if African Americans are in America, there's still sort of this unconscious connection that they have back to Africa um, and, and, the, and the foods that they eat and their religious expressions and what they believe that's sort of unconscious but it's sort of trans uh, still sort of passed down through an African lineage. And then others still will talk about an African framework that not necessarily spe specific ways of sort of exact replication of things in Africa, but is there an African aesthetic and approach that you see in Africa that we can also see expressed in, for example, African American art or music or sermons, the way in speaking patterns, and those kind of issues. And again, as you read, you decide which, which, which seem to be most persuasive for you, and what questions do you have about this dynamic, and what would count for evidence for you that you would find being persuasive in this question about the Africanness of African American religious traditions. And again, just sort of to illustrate it, it's always challenging to, how do you illustrate the movement of so many people from one location to another? So I just put this, this map in here again. It's, it's also kind of challenging to show the movement of a large number of people from one place to another. And so on this map, the thickness, as you look at the, um, the stats, the thickness of the arrows show how many people went. And so again, just to get a sense of the range of places that people came from Africa. Again, this is not all inclusive, but to sort of represent part of that dynamic. And you sort of see how thick the arrows are, how many people actually went to South America. So that's the, where the majority of Africans went in the slave trade, in the slave trade. And you see, it's just one little arrow is the one that goes up to, um, to North America. And so again, um, how that impacts our dynamic as we, as we look at, um, African American religious traditions, uh, North America was actually one of the smaller recipients of the direct um, Atlantic slave trade. Well, the dynamics are pretty different. And so just as a point of comparison to see how things are different between South America and North America, in South America, there's a high male to female ratio. And so you think, well, well how would that impact things? Well, given that dynamic, very few, there weren't as many relationships that developed that produced children. And so in South America, there's this constant flow of the slave trade from Africa to the Americas. So as, as people die in, in slavery, they just begin to import more Africans. And again, presumably coming straight from Africa, having more of a connection to Africa, more of a, a direct contact with Africa more recently, that African religious traditions are vibrant in South America. You even have to ask the question about, well, did it survive? Because they're using the same language, they're doing the same rituals. And so clearly African religious tradition survived in South America. The slave trade also lasts a generation longer in South America. So again, longer slave trade, slave trade, excuse me, existed longer. And so then presumably again, this sort of influx of African culture of people who still have African culture fresh in their mind and that slave trade continues a generation longer than it did uh, to North America.
Uh, Roman Catholicism, again, some would say, well, what are sort of the incubators? What allows religious traditions from Africa to survive in America? Some point to Roman Catholicism. And again, Roman Catholicism, very diverse faith, but pointing to some of the markers. One is the presence of saints. And some have argued, well, saints, people who have lived in the past, uh, who now serve these holy figures. Is there some connection between um, that and ancestors and spiritual figures in African religious traditions? Is there something there that makes that more that connection uh, more easily to connect with Catholicism? And in some cases, Africans being able to kind of covertly continue to follow African religious traditions under the guise of being Catholic. Now, clearly some became Catholic and embraced the faith, but for others, was Catholic Catholicism a, a way that Africans could hold on to religious traditions because many of the concepts were pretty similar? Because there's saints, there's also rituals that they'd be used to, um, the sort of the transubstantiation, the transformation of the bread and wine into the literal body and blood of Jesus. Some would say that sort of transformative power would resonate with some of the categories in African religious traditions, as well as this sort of openness to symbols, that symbols is part of many African religious traditions in Catholicism also, the sense that uh, certain um, certain sacred objects can be imbued with a power. Some would say, that, yeah, that also resonates more so with African religious traditions. As well, really large plantations in South America, much harder to regulate the behavior and practices of Africans. So again, without that regulation, Africans are able to meet more often, be able to make those connections and continue their African religious traditions. Uh, Black-white ratio higher, as I just mentioned, right? Large plantations, harder to suit for white supervisors to uh, watch over the practices of Africans. And a higher mortality rate, and again, that connects to the earlier point, that as Africans are, are dying in large numbers in South America, they're importing more. And so again, this idea that as Africans continue to come from Africa, they have this the recent connection to Africa, and therefore they're able to continue to uh, practice their African religious worldview. The dynamics in North America are pretty different. One, we point to, and again, estimates about how many people in the African slave trade are always being revised. And so this this stat says 9 million, some say 12 million. Really difficult to assess because oftentimes they would, uh, you know, the how many people died in, during the Middle Passage and not keeping the best records. But, um, but again, one estimate, over 9 million African slaves brought to the Americas to 1861. And as I pointed to on that previous map, roughly 4.5% of that number came to, to North America. So a really small number relative to other locations. The male to female ratio, pretty close. And so almost immediately we begin to have men and women having relationships, producing children. And so almost immediately there's a generation in, Amer in the North America of African Americans who had never been to Africa and then presumably never presumably not having that, that first-hand account or understanding of African religious traditions. So we have this community of native-born. Again, in North America, it's pro pro primarily Protestant where these, pro where these plantations are. And so again, Protestants have symbols too, for sure. But again, this idea that um, Protestants don't have symbols, Catholics do, problematic description. But this idea that Protestantism wasn't quite the the incubator for African religious traditions that Roman Catholicism provided. Uh, black to white ratio, pretty close or smaller. So again, greater supervision, really difficult to, um, to sort of beat on their own. Again, laws in place to prevent more than five African Americans from gathering at any one time. So really difficult for Africans, Americans to meet and sort of hold on to, uh, and share their religious worldview. And the seedling process, which Fraser mentioned as well, this, this laws passed against learning to read, laws passed to changing people's names, laws passed against reading, laws against writing, and so laws against gathering together. And so, again, this idea that the seasoning process in North America was de designed to prevent people from gathering together and uniting around an African identity. And so then is there, in the context of North America, um, that partly explains why it's it's more challenging to locate African religious traditions because oftentimes they're not using the same words. But again, if you take Herskovitz's perspective, you look at there's you have to broaden our perspective and look at what are some possibilities for the ways that 
African religious traditions were passed down um, through movement or song and look be more creative in some ways at locating those connections to Africa. Well, that's one framework. We have that framework of what it looks like in sort of comp in the dynamics of African religious traditions in in African American religious communities. And so again, it's challenging. How do you frame the sort of diversity? How how vast African American religious history is? So I just I point towards sort of two categories that seem to be recurrent throughout African American religious history. One's the idea of being an integrationist, and one being a nationalist. So this idea that some are accommodationists, so that in integrationists, this idea that some African American communities and leaders are more inclined to try to adapt to America, to try to work to be accepted, um, trying to fit in, not trying to create a, a stir, up, stir up controversy. And then there are nationalists, those who, um, who, who more proactively look for a way to assert equality and authority in America. So, for example, maybe be clear as we do examples, one is sort of this dichotomy of the house slave and the field slave. So that this idea that as in the early um, history of slavery, the house slave begins to identify more with the master. The house slave is in the house more. They have a different, um, different jobs oftentimes, taking care of children, taking care of the household. And then field slaves who are doing the brutal uh, agricultural work, really challenging and heavy labor. And so again, this idea that these are two fundamentally different perspectives, the house slave perspective and the field slave perspective. The other sort of dichotomy that people will point towards in looking at African American religious history is the idea of a kind of an otherworldly point of view that people who are looking for, well, maybe I won't be equal now, but sometime in the future when I go to heaven, I'll be more accepted or I'll have, finally I'll have peace there. And then on the other hand, there's sort of these slave, I put rebellions in quotes, Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, people who want the want their rights here and now. And so again, these kind of dichotomous positions, lots of different experiences in between those. But I did want to point towards slave and then put slave rebellions in quotes, because again, the words that we use to describe historical moments are really important because uh, you call it a slave rebellion, insurrection, an uprising. These all have certain connotations. Uh, they don't necessarily call them slave revolutions or something. And so is there a way that by calling them rebellions that somehow delegitimize or try to marginalize these different events? But again, as a marker of sort of integrationist versus nationalist, and again, challenging that dynamic, is that a helpful dichotomy to make? To, to have these sort of extremes, but we'll see that over and over in the readings. So I wanted just to challenge that at the outset, and for you, and as with for you, um, all the categories that we encounter, we should be challenging. And so, do we find this sort of integrationist nationalist model persuasive? Because we'll see it over and over again. Booker T. Washington is seen as sometimes an integrationist, accommodationist. Um, whatever different kind of terms for that, that sort of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of dynamic. And again, W.B. Du Bois instead sort of asserting no nationalism, having um, sort of asserting authority, asserting a, for equal rights in America as well. The probably the most the most famous sort of dichotomous positioning is often Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. And again, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, peaceful protest. Um, I have a dream speech is oftentimes where he's he people focus on sort of keep him at that that moment during the during the the the, the work for freedom the civil rights movement and Malcolm X more of the sort of um, by any means necessary you know protect yourself you know really more sort of a, sort of a, more um, assertively. Uh, going for your rights in America and sort of seeing nationalism and identifying as African American and pride in your race. And again, this is how they're often portrayed. But again, we need to challenge that because not like different um, leaders, people's perspective don't stay exactly the same, particularly these two really deep thinkers. And so while Martin Luther King Jr. is often seen as, you know, I have a dream, well, as in his later writings, Martin Luther King, before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. would talk about the poor people's campaign and uniting around economic issues as well as racial issues. Um, he spoke out against the Vietnam War and, and sort of the militaristic approach to problems that the United States have. And again, that's really striking so that as Martin Luther King when lived his life after I had the I Have a Dream speech, became much more pessimistic, you could argue, about – 
um, American society and their and their willingness to in, enact social justice. And so you could argue that Martin Luther King Jr. actually gets more radical as he um, continue his work, while Mar Malcolm X, who again oftentimes is quoted by any means necessary, that as he goes to Mecca and has this profound experience that we read about. He sees the world differently and comes back much more open. He saw white people uh, going on the Hajj and is uh, much more um, open to the possibility that, hey, not all white people are, are bad. Not all white people are the devils, to use the description in the Nation of Islam or for some of the Nation of Islam. And so he has this profound transformation and he comes back to form his own organization as he leads the Nation of Islam and is much more inclusive, much more hopeful, you could argue. So again, you could say, well, we're talking about integrationist or nationalist. Well, when you look at even the lives of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, those categories are problematic because neither stays in that dynamic and they transform over time. And so you could argue that Martin Luther King Jr. was more, na inter more of an integrationist and moved to more of a nationalist, and Malcolm X moved from a nationalist to be more of a integrationist. And again, those are problematic terms. And again, as you read about the different religious figures, see how these try these categories on and see if you find them persuasive or not, or maybe they need to be nuanced in some ways as well. Well, again, this question about um, what's distinct about African American religious traditions and some of those challenges. Well, one is the civil rights movement. And again, this movement for civil rights. Um, boycotting, sit-ins, all these different dynamics to enact change in America. But again, the question about, well, is it a religious movement when we think about it? And you go, again, this sort of this complicated dynamic between the sacred and secular in African American religious history. So that is it a sacred movement? Is it a secular movement? Well, the civil rights movement often met in black churches, which is pretty distinctive, right? It's a, it's a secular movement, presumably, but uh, it meets in black churches, and that speaks to the role that black churches played throughout African-American religious history. Um, you know, civil rights movement, lots of different leaders, lots of very different, very influential people. But Martin Luther King Jr., he was a preacher, right? He's a pastor. So he was the head of the civil rights movement. And so does that make it a religious movement if the leader is the is from a particular religious community? And again, as you watch and hopefully have heard Martin Luther King Jr. speak, uh, what do we call those sermons or speeches? He's clearly speaking and giving a speech and he's um, describing the dynamics facing African Americans in America very eloquently. But you could also make a case that's this chanted sermon that you've seen in, in, that you'll see in black churches. And so is it a speech or is it a sermon when Martin Luther King Jr. and maybe a little bit of both when he's speaking in America? And again, Martin Luther King Jr. is such a, an amazing speaker and able to draw on both religious and American imagery and to interweave those throughout his his speeches. And so again, that challenges when we think about African American religious history, how do we understand those categories of the sacred and the secular? Because they often seem pretty blurred when you look at particular historical moments. That thought was point to to point towards the influence of Gandhi on um, on Martin Luther King Jr. So that we have the the story of, of my experience with the truth. Gandhi wrote his book, described his youth in British ruled India, his education in London, and his work in South Africa that's sometimes overlooked, uh, but prior to his work in India. And so again, Gandhi's influence on Martin Luther King Jr. that Martin Luther King Jr. describes himself is this idea of passive resistance. Well, what does that look like? How do you enact change for social justice? And for Gandhi, it was this idea of ahimsa, right? This non-harming. You don't want to harm anything in your efforts to um, to have justice take place. And so this commitment to determine what the truth is, what is the truth. And then once you find that out, you insist on making it prevail. That becomes your goal. How can you make truth be lived out in reality in a society? And well, how you do that? You do it publicly, you do it actively and non-violently. And again, this idea that, well, how do you get people changed? If people been see the world one particular way and you want them to see it differently, you want people are being oppressed, there's inequities in society, well, how do you get people to recognize those inequities? Particularly, they might be benefited from those. How do you get people to see the world differently? And so for Gandhi, it was educating others. And you have to help people to see the truth, tr see the truth, because for the truth to prevail, Gandhi said, it's always going to invite resistance. People are always going to be sort of, going to be hesitant to embrace the truth. So how do you get people to change their mindset? And for Gandhi, it was to, to accept there's going to be resistance, 
They're going to try to punish you for whatever you're doing to try to to reveal the truth to the broader community. And so, how do you how do you how do you get people to see the world differently? Well, so Gandhi, well, Gandhi said you have to call attention to the injustice. Uh, then that's going to educate people, and then that's going to show that your actions are are valid. They're authentic. Once so you have to sort of have these confrontations to confront the powers that be and illustrate to them that there is injustice in society. And then once they see that, once they're educated about that, then they'll change and then the dynamics of the community will change as well. So Gandhi said, never submit to an untruth or injustice. And so you oppose every unjust law. If there's an unjust law in society, you break it over and over again and you, you, you take the consequences for it. But it's in, sh in breaking that unjust law that's going to awaken those in power to say, oh, that's an unjust law. I see them being persecuted unjustly and then to change society in that way. And so we see that dynamic Martin Luther King Jr., all these different ideas in the civil rights movement drawing on that dynamic of nonviolent marches, sit-ins, um, breaking the laws, but doing it nonviolently, right? Not causing harm. And then by illustrating that, those terrible dynamics, that's going to cause them to change the laws. And again, we see that with the civil rights movement. I was read about that as people saw the water hoses, you know, the fire hoses putting on young children and locking children up in jail and beating people and sicking dogs on them, that it's once they, once Americans saw that, then the civil rights movement could really take off because the injustice had been shown. So Martin Luther King Jr. talks about how he's indebted to many of the ideas of, of Gandhi and put them into practice in the civil rights movement. And again, as we think about rituals during this time period, when we talked about rites of passage, we talked about Arnold Van Gennep and his three-part model and talking about initiation rites. But he also had applied that model to pilgrimage so that as people go to sacred sites in various religious communities, they go to these sites and have these profound experiences and then usually return back to the community they came from or to another community. And so Victor Turner, another theorist, talked about what happens during pilgrimage. One is this idea of communitas, which Turner called an unstructured state in which all members of a community are equal, allowing them to share a common experience. And so again, if we think back to Malcolm X's experience, he comes to Mecca, right? He's, he's having this disagreement with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. He goes to Mecca, has this profound experience, sees white people there as well. Again, he had come from a tradition that talked about white people being the devil from their uh, perspective. And so he sees, um, uh, because of the Hajj, everyone wears the same, you know, very simple garb. Everyone does the pilgrimage in the same order. Everyone has the same experience of, excuse me, of sleeping and eating. And so again, Malcolm X has been exposed. He had never seen this sort of, he come from America with a very hierarchical system where African Americans are being oppressed and segregated. And here he had this profound experience where people of different races, colors, creeds, different ethnicities coming together and having this shared experience um, and in, in Islam and around Allah. And so for uh, Malcolm X, you could argue he had this sense, this deep sense of of connection with people um, where everyone's equal, allowing them to share this common experience, this community toss that happens. So again, I'll ask you as you think about your own experience, have you ever had some sort of this deep experience with a group of people that you go, wow, would just all the other identities fade away and you're all united around one particular goal and shared experience? And so well, back to Van Gennep, this idea that, well, how does his model work with pilgrimage? This idea that you separate, you enter into this liminal state where you're betwixt and between identities, and then you return back to your community. So again, Malcolm X's experience on the Hajj is one way of, of thinking about that dynamic of uh, going to the Hajj, experiencing that equality and having this profound sense of, of communitas and then returning back to America to form his own independent Muslim community. And again, I put this quote because Malcolm X also had this sort of very literary style and able to mesh spiritual and religious images. And so um, it was what his famous quote about, we didn't land at Plymouth Rock, the rock was landed on us. Really striking of turning that, that dynamic on its head that somehow America is about freedom, but what does freedom look like for African Americans? Did they land at Plymouth Rock or did the slave trade 
land the rock on them. So again, we also have this category of myth. And so we read about the nation of Islam and the story of Mr. Jacob and the creation of the races, which again is a very different kind of myth. It's a story of creation, but it's about the story of Mr. Jacob who, um, who has a falling out with, um, with Allah. And so he's a very smart person and decides to make a devil right white race. Again, this is their language from the tradition. So he begins to, um, have people um, produce children that are successfully lighter. So if you're lighter skinned and lighter skinned, he would keep um, having them mate, probably not the word, but have children. And eventually there's this light race that approaches you that people become lighter and lighter skinned and they eventually become uh, white in terms of their skin color. And so again, here's a narrative that blends genetics. So this idea of sort of, um, you know, so breeding people to use their language to, to be lighter and lighter to create this quote unquote devil right race. Uh, so, but it includes also genetics. So it has science in the story. And it's also striking. It talks about race that not very often have sort of a, uh, a religious narrative that embraces race. But it does raise those kinds of questions because for, at least in the early, um, incarnation of the nation of Islam, the idea was that uh, that God is black and that if you, and again, did a lot of outreach, Nation of Islam did a lot of outre outreach outside of black churches with this, what they call fishing, doing that same line over and over again, well, what's your white God done for you today? And so again, from the Nation of Islam's perspective, the idea was that God is black and there's a devil right race and you can sort of see that played out in society in the way that white people treat African Americans. And again, really striking, says something of that dynamic that Malcolm X could hear a story about uh, the white people being the devil and him go, yeah, maybe. Because for him, looking at his life experience, uh, it was a white judge that separated himself from his family. It was a white judge that and had his mother institutionalized in a, in a mental facility. Um, he, you know, it's it's over and over in his life, white people haven't been the best for him. And so when he hears that white people are a devil, that actually resonates with him and his experience. But again, he, he has that revelation in, or that experience in Mecca, that where he sees the world differently and, and backs off a lot of that, those ideas of white people being the devil. But it does raise this really striking dynamic of, of stories, that, that a religious story that includes science, and also addresses race. Because for the nation of Islam, the idea is that the way you imagine God matters. And so if you imagine God as white, as you're, and you're African American, that from Elijah Muhammad's perspective in the nation of Islam, that causes psychological damage. That if you don't see your God the way you see God, um, or you don't see God being in the same skin color looking like you do, that it really causes psychological damage. And so I just put this image uh, from Walter Salman, one of the, I guess the most, most widely purchased images of, of Jesus. And again, if that's the way Jesus looked, uh, Malcolm X said, early in his career in the nation of Islam, what psychological damage does that do to you if your God doesn't look like you? And so again, really a striking kind of question of when you think about religious traditions, do people really talk about, do myths really talk about the race of God? It's really striking. So in this tradition, really front and center, that from their perspective, if this is the way you see God and that's not how you look, then it's really challenging to, um, to embrace that tradition that it causes some, it causes the self-hatred among African Americans if you see God this way. And again, a really striking dynamic of raising all these really interesting questions about race and religion that we may not have encountered in other traditions that we've looked at so far in the course. And also this question about what's distinctive about African American religious communities. Well, one people point towards is the formation of black theology. So lots of really deep thinkers, but one person that's often pointed towards as being sort of central in that dynamic is James Cone. He wrote a book on black theology and black power. And again, he pointed towards what he saw as the uh, white supremacy of white Christianity, that um, that white Americans, while they may talk about racial injustice, didn't seem to be doing a lot to to change that. And so James Cone actually began thinking about leaving the Christian church, but then he thought, no, he started focusing on is there a theology that could speak specifically to the experiences of African Americans that again, you know, had been through slavery, discrimination, lots of violence, particularly in the South. And so where was the Christianity that spoke to their experiences? And so James Cone called, formed what he called Black Liberation Theology that transformed Jesus as something sometimes seen as a sort of a supporter of the status quo, 
to someone of uh, looking at the passage in the Bible that focus on Jesus as identifying explicit with the explicitly with the oppressed. That for James Cone, when he read the New Testament, he saw Jesus that, that helped the poor, that sought who was who sought and to help those that were marginalized, and so he saw Jesus as more of a second Moses that could deliver African Americans from their condition in America, and less so one for the status quo. So again, we see that as being a kind of particularly um, distinctive formulation of a theology within some African American communities. But even that raises particular issues because African American women begin to raise issues to say, well, does black liberation theology do enough? That it definitely addresses racial dynamics in America, but does it address the experiences of women? And so uh, scholars like Dolores Williams and Katie Cannon form what they called womanist theology. What they saw as being a challenge to the feminist movement, so the white feminist movement, that many black women felt they were being excluded, their voice were being excluded from those communities. And in particular, African American women had different dynamics that they faced in America than uh, white women maybe have faced. And so they challenged the black patriarchy and sexism that they saw in black churches, and in particular that, um, and as well as in the civil rights movement, that as these sort of movements for freedom and equity in society, that women are often relegated to the stereotypical roles in the movements of you know being secretaries or going to get coffee or something but instead of being seen as foundational to the leadership while there clearly were female leaders not to say that but that there was you know there's some sexism within the civil rights movement sexism within the black church that prevented some women from being pastors if they wanted to be or relegating to teaching sunday school and again some were empowered by that but for others it was why are, why are black churches replicating some of the injustices that you see in society outside of the black church? And so again, this idea that you need to draw upon the insights of women, focusing on that. And so this movement to look at role models for women within the Bible that again, often overlooked. So, so Hagar, who's, has a, a challenging experience in the Bible, driven into the wilderness by, by a patriarchal society. A uh, woman's theology said was to look at how can you draw upon these women that are so overlooked in the Bible and look to them to be role models. What does it mean to be a black woman in America and fight for justice? Well, looking to the Bible for biblical biblical women in the past who also faced challenging situations and called upon called upon God to help change those situations and to be empowered for change. And then we read about the article on the verse migration, the rise of black megachurches. So again, great migration, early 20th century, there was a migration, large migration of African Americans from the south to the north, as well as from rural cities in the south and moving to more to larger cities in the south. Well, some scholars are pointing toward a similar reverse migration that's taken place, or that took place in the 1970s, where African Americans left the north and began returning to the south. And so in those locations, there's been the formation of what's been called megachurches. And again, there's lots of different definitions of what a megachurch is. One is that you have over 2,000 weekly attendees that come to the church. And so there's megachurches all over the, the country, um, black megachurches, particularly in Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, Los Angeles, really large congregations. And so again, as we think about what's the, this is the, the sort of history of African American religious communities, what does the future look like? Well, one is this question about mega churches and what role they play. How do we account for the rise of these churches? They're so, so huge. Um, and so do they meet certain needs? What is it that is about these really large gatherings that seems to resonate with some African Americans as well as, you know, the white mega churches as well? And so one is this question about is there a role of anonymity? That is, there's something about being in a large group, um, as we're in the, you know, 21st century. There's something about being in a large group, having the anonymity that meets, that makes people feel more comfortable going to a larger church. Do people like the variety of having a big church? So like you would go to the mall and do like one, one stop shopping. Is there something about mega churches and being able to have childcare, but to do outreach, but also have a softball team or, or do you know, economic work in the community? Is there a way that mega churches provide a range of services like other consumer goods or consumer goods that draw people to those communities? Others have pointed toward this idea of seekers that maybe people have had a negative experience with churches in the past. And so mega churches don't look like traditional churches in many cases. 
So oftentimes the pews are taken out and there's you know stadium seating, or oftentimes the mega churches are situated in structures that weren't churches but became churches, so an, an abandoned Walmart or an abandoned sports stadium, and then those 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 places are then transformed into sacred sites. And so oftentimes the sermons are a little bit shorter. There's often like like a big screen in front and contemporary music and keeps it going. And so it's more of a lighthearted production, lots of bright lighting. And so the idea is that those who uh, sort of move, movable podium can stay. And so this idea that mega churches draw people that may not feel comfortable in, in church, traditional churches. And so they come to mega churches to feel it's more like a, it's just comfortable. They don't have flashbacks to a potentially negative experience. There's also the rise of a gospel prosperity that some have called. And so some black preachers uh, making the case that if you're spiritually, uh, if you're doing well spiritually, that God will bless you materially so that you have a nice car, a nice house. And again, some see that as departure from that message in civil rights movement of equity and moving forward, um, that the gospel prosperity, how that functions into potentially the attractiveness of of black mega churches. And this question again about is it post denominational? As we, as we read about, denominations have been really important throughout African American religious history, black Baptist traditions, AME Church, AME Zion, for example. But now have we entered into a time where it's these uh, these non-denominational church, churches where they're not identifying one particular denomination, but instead they're sort of these more open, open-armed dynamics. And so uh, is, are we in a post-denominational period where denominations are less important? It's sort of these less denominational affiliation becoming less upfront. And even the question of the black church, this category that you'll see throughout the readings, the black church, the black church, not even black churches in the plural, but this idea that the black church has certain attributes to it. And so the question now is, well, do, is that still a category that still resonates? Uh, because that article we read, um, also pointed towards the black church, well, whether that category still resides, because oftentimes black churches don't identify as black churches. Even if you have 95% membership of African Americans, uh, they don't necessarily identify as a black church if they were a church for everybody. So again, is the black church as a category transforming and is that something that's still relevant today or whether some other sort of marker will be on the landscape of African American religious history? Well, again, that is just some highlights, again, of some of the key things you'll likely come across. Again, as you read Decide, whether you find the integrationist, nationalist dynamic helpful, uh, whether you find the rituals described, how we would understand those, whether theoretical frameworks like Van Gannup and Victor Turner, how they shape how we understand those various rituals and stories. And again, as you and again, as you read, read the different myths, how does that ca ca challenge our understanding of myth? And as we looked at uh, previous communities in the course, well, that's our framework for the day. Hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you have wonderful conversations in your class in your discussion sections, and I hope you have a great week.